Welcome to the Andrew Jackson Centre at Bonnie Before Carrick Fergus. This centre commemorates the 7th American President Andrew Jackson whose parents came from just down the road. Also tucked away is the US Rangers Centre out the back, a little military museum which is very unique because the US Rangers are the only American regiment which was raised outside the United States and it was formed here in Carrick Fergus in June 1942. So there's lots of history here, lots to explore and talk about. So let's begin our journey. The first thing you notice when you come into this cottage is really this room and particularly the fireplace. The fireplace is the centre of the household. It's where people stayed warm, it's where they cooked, it's where they socialised around the fire. And this room gives you a sense of that from the 17th century and the 18th century architecture. It was continually inhabited by the one family until the 1970s, so that's quite a record. And that family were called the Donaldsons, and they were neighbours to the Jacksons, who lived just down the road from us. So Andrew Jackson, the seventh president, his mother and father would have been in this cottage undoubtedly. They would have been around it and they would have been talking to the people around this little area called Bonnie Before, which was named by the Scots because it was a bonny wee place before Carrick Fergus. Now we're going to go outside to a more modern uh, historical period, into the, the period of the Second World War, into 1940s, and explore the US Rangers and then try to connect what what relates between the Rangers here and Andrew Jackson as the seventh president? And there is a, a strong connection. So let's go and have a, a look. Have you ever met Miss Lindy? She's a gal with a bright red hair. Now nah, she stands out from all the rest. You'd know her anywhere. Now this little museum has a very modern feel to it. It's fantastic in terms of the amount of interpretation and the artefacts and the story that is told in really a relatively small space. And it relates to the Second World War. The United States entered the war after the attack on Pearl Harbor. By January 1942, the first American troops were on their way across from New York to Belfast and they had arrived in Northern Ireland. Northern Ireland became a very important uh, place for American training and for American army camps. And at one time, by 1944, it's estimated that one in 10 people who lived in Northern Ireland were actually American. And in some parts of the country, that was even larger. And in County Fermanagh, for example, one in four people you would have bumped into was from the United States because they were here with the military. And there was also a naval presence as well and an air force presence. But it's the military presence that's very pertinent to this site. And it relates to the regiment called the US Rangers, which still exists today. It was founded here in Carrick Fergus in June 1942 at a place called Sunnylands and was recruited from volunteers within the US uh, military who had arrived over into Northern Ireland. The first commander was uh, Major William Darby. Sometimes the regiment is known historically in that period as Darby's Rangers and there was a film to that effect as well with James Garner. So they're a very famous regiment and it's very unique that they are, are formed outside of the United States and even more unique in Northern Ireland terms that they're formed here in Carrick Fergus. So there's lots of detail about the regiment, uh, some photographs of the old camp at Sunnylands here as well too, and details about their training which was in Carrick Fergus and then across uh, into the Highlands of Scotland where they trained. And they trained really for what was called Operation Torch initially, which was the invasion of North Africa and then into Sicily and into Italy. Very successful in North Africa and Sicily, and the regiment took heavy losses then in Italy. Other battalions were formed, and the US Rangers then subsequently took part in the Normandy landings and, and also in the Philippines, uh, where they were very active as well too. So you can read lots about them and see lots of interesting artifacts and footage from the US Rangers and from, from the period uh, when this little museum was first established in Carrick Fergus. And when that happened, some of the original rangers were still alive and they were here for that ceremony. So it was quite amazing to get first-hand accounts from those men of their memories and their time in the rangers at the very beginning. And you can see all of that in this centre and it's, it's, a, it's just somewhere to become absorbed uh, in history. Mm -hmm. 
Now in the 1940s, Northern Ireland wasn't a place that was very well known uh, in the United States of America. So whenever the uh, United States entered the war, and Northern Ireland was picked as effectively the training ground for many, many of their, their troops. There was a little guidebook which was produced to uh, give them a sense of where they were coming to. Um, the guidebook is on display in the centre and it's a fascinating little book. It suggests that you don't talk about uh, religion or politics when you come to Northern Ireland because that might cause a bit of dissension. It also makes them aware that Northern Ireland is um, on an island and that the Irish Free State is not part of the, the, uh, the, the war so it's a neutral country and you mustn't stray across the border so they're given advice on that. Also given advice on, on uh, driving. They're, they're told that for example you can find flocks of sheep or herds of cattle in town centres and that they have right of way so that's specifically for the drivers of the American trucks and so on to, to bear in mind. So all of this fascinating stuff in the little booklet which you can see uh, when you come here. Men who have served in the US Rangers in the past uh, would come because when they're being trained part of the induction is about the history of the regiment and Carrick Fergus is the birthplace of the US Rangers, they're told. So it has a, a quite an elevated position in terms of their outlook as a regiment. And uh, that's very, very important from uh, regimental histories and from military histories and so on. And I remember when I was tour guide here a few years ago, there were two senior ladies arrived in a taxi and they were about to head back to the States the next day. So this was the last port of call. We had just closed the door and set the alarms when they arrived, uh, but we, we brought them in and they didn't want to see the Cottage particularly, they wanted to see the US Rangers Museum, so brought them in here and it turned out their brother had been in one of the first battalions of the Rangers. So there is a list of the, the men's names uh, on the computer in here and they were able to look and to see his name and they were just so uh, in awe of this whole situation once they got in here and saw his name. It was a direct connection for them. He had long passed away, he was older than they were and this was a direct connection back to him and we took a little photograph of them and one of the sisters stood to attention. It was just amazing, she just stood to attention as if she was in the Rangers herself. So I think it showed just the strong connection, the strong sense uh, that this, this regiment creates among the people who are connected to it in different ways. And as a regiment, US Rangers takes us back to the idea of the frontiers and where these settlers such as Andrew Jackson and others grew up and lived. Uh, because the original Rangers was called Rogers Rangers and it goes back to the 18th century, particularly to the Seven Years' War, when a man called Rogers, uh, an Ulster Scot or Scott Jerry settler from County Tyrone, established this militia called Rogers Rangers. And they were well known for really for two things. They were, they were very good at camouflage in the forests and also they were very rapid in terms of moving forward. They went very quickly from one place to another. And when the modern Rangers was formed, they took the example of Rogers Rangers and they took the name uh, of US Rangers from that as well. And the example was used in the training that these men did not use vehicles to get around in their training. They moved very, very quickly uh, on foot and uh, could quite astonish people with the speeds that, that they were more or less running as opposed to marching. That whole tradition went back to the frontiers and that's where the connection with Rangers comes from here in Carrick Fergus. So uh, let's go and explore a little bit more about the, the Jackson Cottage and take us back further in time uh, to the period of the 18th century. We've got this large volume by American writer Marquis James who looked at the life of Andrew Jackson in, in two volumes. This is a combined two volumes and uh, he tells us that the, the story of Jackson. It's quite an amazing story for me because of this journey from this little settlement here at Bonnie before by his parents and his two brothers across the Atlantic. A long journey in itself, a long voyage across that, that ocean and then into uh, an area called the Waxhaw region of South Carolina, North Carolina. Um, it was an area that lots of settlers had, had gone to and it was really on the frontiers at the time. When Rogers and his militia were on the frontiers up in New Hampshire, you had lots of settlement further south then and lots of people from this part of the world in, in all of those settlements. And the reasons um, included the fact that there was really cheap and available land to go across to. The average size of a farm in County Antrim from the 1600s until about 1940s was about 30 acres of land so today that would be not seen as a very large farm and it would be a difficult farm to survive on financially 
The difficulty was that if you had the number of sons in the family, then what were they going to do? And the farm could end up being, being carved up quite a bit to allow them to farm as well. So in the Carolinas, it was very, very different. There was lots of available land. You got 100 acres for the head of a household who went and 50 acres for every member of the family who went. And some of these families were quite large that went across. The Jackson family unit was father and mother and two sons at this stage when they left Bonnie before. Um, and the allocation of land for them would be unimaginable um, in terms of the, the amount of land that they could own. The only thing about this land was that it was not pasture land ready just to settle on. It had to be cleared. A lot of it was forest, it was rough ground and it was really, really hard work. Not everyone really achieved what they hoped when they went and the Jackson family were probably uh, to fall into that category. Andrew Jackson Sr found it very hard work on the, on the land and he died, his biographer suggests, uh, through a heart condition, through uh, hard work on the land, just before his third son, Andrew, was actually born. The son of a man who worked his fingers to the bone Just trying to make something out of nothing, you know He never wanted silver, gold, or the final thing just some wife and kids at home in the American dream. So hard work, quite a, a journey across the world effectively to get to this new settlement that you were going to. Um, so the, the driving force uh, really was this idea of land and also family connection very often, which was the case with the Jacksons. Elizabeth Jackson had five sisters, all of whom had settled in the Waxhaw region before the Jacksons decided to go out themselves. So they were the last of the family group to go across in 1765. There's still a Native American presence in, in part of that area, the Catawba Indians who, uh, who worked with the settlers and were quite friendly with them. Uh, and it's on the boundaries between North and South Carolina. This map gives you a sense, not just of the geography of the area, but it also lists where some of the people lived and particularly those that are connected to the Jacksons. So there's George McKemney, who was uh, Jackson's mother. Uh, her sister was married to George McKemney. James Crawford and Robert Crawford, also family members. Her husband died just before Andrew was born. She was heavily pregnant, so she went to one of her sisters and stayed on their farm. And that's where Andrew Jackson was born. And Elizabeth then started to look after the children of the family. And uh, that's how she made a living then. They had to give up the idea of this farm that they were going to get because there was nobody to work the farm. She had two younger sons and then a baby now as well and herself and that wasn't going to work out. So the start of this was not very uh, auspicious in terms of the Jackson family, but their son Andrew would become the seventh president and that journey was quite a long journey uh, for him. It was impacted by, by loss. By the time Andrew Jackson uh, was a, a teenager, he was an orphan. His, his father had died before he was born. His mother and his two brothers died during the American Revolution. They were uh, supporting George Washington, they were taking part in the revolution, and one of them, uh, Hugh, died of exhaustion during one of the battles in the Carolinas. And the Carolinas is a very, very hot place in the summertime, so uh, I, I can understand, having been there, how in the midst of all of this, uh, someone would actually drop down with exhaustion. Andrew's other brother and himself were taken prisoner by the British authorities, and they were taken to a prison camp. They caught smallpox there, and Elizabeth managed to get them released from prison and she tried to nurse them back but one of the sons died and Andrew was the only survivor then uh, of her three sons. Elizabeth herself died during the revolution nursing wounded American prisoners uh, at what was called Charlestown or now Charleston in South Carolina. By the time that revolution or war of independence was over Andrew Jackson was on his own. Uh, he had his, his uncles and aunts but he was an orphan, he had no immediate family. Um, so I think that's why his story is so significant really and uh, so powerful because if an orphan boy whose family comes from County Antrim can enter the White House, then that is really the American dream, which America aspired to this idea of the American dream that anybody could achieve anything in America. And that's what Andrew Jackson did. He's such a pivotal figure in early American history um, and it's it's quite amazing to think that his parents and his brothers would have, have ran around here and I'm always really interested in the, the anecdotes of history and um, this author uh, Marcus James talks about how Andrew Jackson and another very prominent 
um, Ulster Scott called Sam Houston, uh, who was a, from Tennessee and then became the president of Texas. How when they met in the White House, they would get animated in conversation and they would lapse into Ulster accents. Um, and at the start, I thought that was a bit fanciful. But the more I thought about it, I thought, no, it's not actually because uh, Jackson grew up at his mother's knee. He heard lots of stories of Carrick Fergus and the accents that he grew up with were Ulster accents and Sam Houston grew up in a little settlement called Timber Ridge in Virginia which was a settlement peopled by lots of families from Lauren. So those accents would have come down uh, into their uh, vocabulary and their knowledge and their ken if you like. Uh, so it is quite amazing to think of that very human factor uh, in, in relation to it all. Jackson's rise to, to power and fame really involved a lot of his military uh, career. He uh, was in the militia, he was very prominent in, in what was called the War of 1812, which is sometimes regarded by historians as America's second war of independence. It was a war against Britain. And at the Battle of New Orleans, Jackson really came to national prominence. He faced the, the finest uh, army in Europe with Colonel Pakenham and he defeated them. There was lots of stories attached to this, lots of legend attached to it. There was a very famous song uh, called The Hunters of Kentucky, which ep epitomised the fact that these backwoods men from Kentucky had assembled and went down to support Jackson at, at New Orleans and had won the victory because they were really sharpshooters because they were hunters in the forest and so forth. Not entirely correct, but added to the legend. The most famous song that is associated then with Jackson in that period is called The Battle of New Orleans, which people like Johnny Horton and the nitty gritty dirt band made very very famous um, and it tells this story of, of going down with Jackson and winning a great victory and that victory really helped to propel Jackson in terms of his uh, persona in the, in the national psyche effectively. You knew where you were with Andrew Jackson, he wasn't from the aristocracy, there was no given that he would end up in, in power and so forth and he developed political campaigns by going around speaking to people at camp meetings and so on so his hustings was out in the in the countryside out in the rural areas and when it came to uh, the election his first effort he received the majority of the votes but there were uh, four candidates and there was a little bit of a cartel with the, the aristocracy so they ensured that Jackson didn't get elected, that the others combined and he was ended up second best in that context. But the second time uh, he went to uh, the polls, Jackson was victorious and it was seen as a watershed in American history. Jacksonian democracy had come to stay, the idea that the common man had a big say uh, in, in who governed and all of that was very, very significant. And whenever he, he went to Washington for his inauguration, his people went with him, much to the annoyance uh, of those in Washington because all these, what they regarded as, as hillbillies came into town. Uh, it was a bit of a free for all in the White House when the inauguration had taken place. Uh, there is a, a rumor that at one point uh, some of the servants in the White House took punch bowls out into the grounds to try and get the people out of the White House and away from the Capitol buildings and so on, uh, into the, just under the lawns. It epitomised the fact that this was a political shock and that this man had come to power. Uh, he wasn't from the traditional political blocs or the aristocracy. And also the fact that there was a sea change in American society happening and it was the beginning of sort of era of the common man, common democracy and so forth. To me it's really interesting that um, whenever Jackson left office he was even more popular than when he went into office. So he was a very popular president and he did some very popular things. He, he uh, was very much against the idea of centralised banks and believed in decentralisation, which is a very common thing within these Scotch-Irish settlements and, and settlers and so on. And he's known as Old Hickory because he was as tough as a hickory rod, effectively. He could lose his temper very quickly, and I think a lot of that relates to his early years with his mother and growing up and so on, and the experience he had on the frontier. He's uh, seen uh, in modern times as not at all sympathetic towards Native Americans. Uh, the Cherokee Trail of Tears is ascribed to him as the president when the Cherokee Indians were moved to reservations um, and a lot lost their lives on this Trail of Tears uh, going across to Oklahoma. Um, and he also was a slave 
holder, slave owner, which was common for the time in the, the areas and so on that uh, that he grew up in in the front here. So he is a he's not a perfect individual, but there aren't too many of those around uh, historically. Um, but he is a, a an interesting example of the type of people who left this part of the world and the qualities and the outlook that they took with them and the determination I think most of all that they took with them to achieve better uh, because that was what took them in the first place and Andrew Jackson may not have been born here uh, although he joked himself that he was born on the way across the Atlantic and didn't quite know what he was uh, but that was just a joke he was born in the Waxhaw but he, he inherited it from principally his mother I think the traits and the characteristics and the outlook of these Ulster Scots. Um, and the story of the Jacksons is, is well told here in the Jackson Centre in relation to all of the, the history of the family, the movement across, Jackson's uh, political career and so on. So you can learn much more about it here at the Andrew Jackson Centre. And I hope you will come and, and visit and see both the Jackson story and the Rangers story laid out for you in this fantastic little museum. Thank you.